Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Pipeline Podcast presented by Ruoff Mortgage. As always, I'm your host, Dylan Tyre. We're continuing our draft prep this week with Sam Cosentino of Sportsnet. Sam, first and foremost, it's great to meet you. Thanks very much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, Dylan, thank you. I think there's some exciting times ahead here for uh, for your organization, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's going to be centered around the draft. But if you look at recent drafts, too, I think uh, there should be a lot of excitement there in Columbus. Yeah, tell me first and foremost what you think about the Blue Jackets organization because you really go back to 2021. That's when everything changed for this organization. Seth Jones going to the Chicago Blackhawks. The Blue Jackets get a haul in return. They end up drafting Kent Johnson at 5th overall, Cole Sillinger at 12th overall, Corson Kuhlemans at 25th overall. Plus, you get guys like Adam Boquist and Jake Bean as parts of that deal. Uh, and then after that, the Blue Jackets draft David Yurichek and Denton Matejchuk at number six and number 12 last year. So your thoughts on the stance of the organization right now? I think really well well positioned. So, I mean, if you start in the back end, which is where everyone wants to start, I mean, I think Yurichek's ready to play as early as next year and probably meaningful minutes. I think Matejchuk will take a, a little bit of time, but I really like what he has to bring to the table. Kuhleman still has some time along his developmental path as well. But the other guy that I really um, have a fondness for is Stanislav Sozil. I, I thought he was excellent this year with, with Regina, you know, playing at the World Juniors. Obviously, it's nice to play with a guy like Connor Bedard on your, on your regular club team as he did with the Pats uh, all season long. But if you think about that lineage, I think from the defensive aspect, you know, Columbus is, is well suited there. Now, you want to flip sides and, and talk about the, the guys like, uh, you know, Kent Johnson and, and Sillinger, who I think have established themselves. I mean, Sillinger a little bit up and down this year, but, you know, with those guys being supplemented, and I think about Chinnikov, I think about Marchenko, and the year he's come on to have, you know, at the end of the year was really good for them. And then the future with a guy like Dume, I think is going to be a really good player. What a, what a crazy year he had in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. So w when you look at that, what it speaks to to me is that you go into this 2023 draft and you can truly sit with the mantra of taking best player available. I mean, every team tells you that that's what they're going to do in the first place, but I don't necessarily believe that. I always believe that there's some sort of positional need that is the undercurrent for some teams. That undercurrent is a little more flowing for other teams, not as much. But when you're stocked up in both areas of the ice, uh, I think that speaks well to being able to take the best player available. Yeah, it certainly does. And I guess that brings us perfectly into talking about the 2023 NHL draft coming up later this month in Nashville. We actually get to officially say that now later this month in Nashville. I'm very, very excited to be there and see who the Blue Jackets are able to grab at number three overall. But where do you think this draft compares to some of the drafts of years past? Because You've got a generational talent in Connor Bedard at number one overall. A lot of people call Matt Vaymichkov a generational talent as well. So two generational talents potentially in this draft. There's some extracurriculars there with Michkov, but there are a lot of players that are exciting after those two as well that might be the number one overall pick in any other year. So what do you think of this year? Yeah, really good depth. So I'd characterize it in a couple of different ways. I'd look at Bedard kind of in his own class, obviously, and then I'd probably put Fantilli, um, along with Leo Carlson in their own class. Mitchkov, again, is in a class by himself, but with some of the extracurriculars or things that are surrounding this player, most notably his contract for, for the next couple of years here, you know, he, he's in an entirely different class. I think from a, from a pure hockey vacuum, you could say he would be in the conversation with those other four. And maybe in a regular draft year, he's challenging Connor Bedard for that first overall spot. That's obviously not the case. So now let's take a step beyond those four players, and here's what we want to talk about. I think you're seeing a lot of forwards, uh, smallish, meaning that 5'10 to 6 foot range, 170 pounds to 185 pounds, if you will. We have a lot of uh, really skilled forwards in a similar spot. Uh, you know, if I think about uh, a Zach Benson as being one of those players, if I think about a Ryan Leonard as being one of those players, they're very similar in terms of stature. Uh, the ability to produce points. And then at that point, I think scouts really have to drill down on what the character is about and, and what the player looks like uh, off ice. Then I'd look at a defense, uh, a defensive group that speaks to most likely David Reinbacher and Axel Sandin Pelicas being the first two off the board. Thomas Willander might have a say in all of that. Those are probably the three defensemen off the board. Then I do believe there is a gap. 
So we're going to see a couple of guys probably drag up the bottom part of that first round of the draft because, you know, defensemen have uh, traditionally more value. If they're right shot defensemen, that adds that extra tick of value. We will see some of those guys. But when you're talking about the top three, um, you, you know, you have some right shot defensemen in there. And I think that's, that's uh, you know, that's really key and probably adds additional value. And then you're looking at a group of players in terms of its depth, all told, which I think runs pretty deep. And I think it runs well into the second round and, and, and maybe towards the end of the second round. So I'm really excited about this draft class. It is interesting because we still have the effects of COVID uh, from when players weren't able to either play at all or, or play in a regular schedule that have come up through those COVID years. So I'm fascinated five years uh, down the road to look at this draft class and see exactly where we're at. Tell me about the decision the Anaheim Ducks have to make at number two overall, because you just mentioned there, you see Adam Fantilli and Leo Carlson in that kind of tier right below Connor Bedard. So in your eyes, does Pat Verbeek have a decision to make there, or is it Adam Fantilli all the way? Well, I I think it's Fantilli, um, and and I think that, you know, for this reason, although Pat Verbeek wasn't around for the Ryan Getzlaff days, I I just look at Fantilli as being that Getzlaff type player who – you know, who's got some size, who doesn't mind playing a physical game, but not really an aggressor in that regard, but can definitely handle it. He's got really good speed. He's got excellent skill. And he's got a, a really nice track record, you know, having won the Hobie Baker and having won gold with Canada at the World Juniors. So there's a really a lot to like about that player. Now, you flip over to that and you think about Leo Carlson, who for a big portion of the year in the SHL played on the wing. You know, we see him at the end of the year on the national team at the Worlds. He's playing center on their top line. So that leads me to believe that everybody in the National Hockey League, Scouts Lake, feel that he projects as a center, as a guy who's got some size, as a guy who uh, is really smart with the puck. He protects it really well. He's got a lot of poise. He really seems to know where to go in the ice. So I, I don't think you lose with either one of them. I do think Fantilli has just slightly more of a dynamic element, and that's probably what puts him over the top of Carlson. But you're really splitting hairs there, I believe. Talk to me about Leo Carlson versus Will Smith then, because uh, some people will say that they see Will Smith to the Blue Jackets at number three overall. So can you compare those two players for me? Yeah, you know what? That's a great question, Dylan. I think Will has definitely entered the conversation there. I mean, you're talking about a guy who plays at such a high pace But again, smart enough to be able to pace the game. And so there are a lot of guys who have the ability to pace the game, but maybe they can't play at that top speed. And I think Will Smith has the ability to do that. I met with the young man a couple of times throughout the course of the year. I was really enamored with the character um, that he brings to the table. A guy who walks into a room and, and, and lights up the room with a smile, his passion for hockey, you know, the path that he's taken. Um, and, and then I have to consider the line he played on uh, with Leonard and pro at the U S under 18 program, maybe the best line that they've ever had. Um, and, you know, each guy with over 50 goals and well over hundred points. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting scenario to see that when you have that guy down the middle of the ice, who's driving the play with two really successful line mates, that speaks to me about his ability to distribute the puck. It speaks to me about his teammates wanting to defer to him as well you know, uh, having surpassed that, that 50 goal plateau. So there's plenty, plenty to like about Will Smith. And to be perfectly honest with you, Dylan, like it, it wouldn't surprise me if Will ended up in that three spot and then Carlson uh, falls to the San Jose Jarks at, at, at number four. But again, as I would talk about Fantilli and Carlson, I would probably speak in the same vein about Smith and Carlson. And again, Smith probably brings a little bit more of a dynamic speed element than when Carlson, uh, than what Carlson would bring to the table. But Car- Carlson is, he's just so cerebral and he's really good along the wall. We've seen how wall play has really become a hot topic in these playoffs. And maybe that recency bias ha- uh, becomes a deciding factor uh, as well. In your eyes, has Will Smith kind of become the high upside guy? Like, I feel like just the amount of offense in his game, people see that, or maybe they look at Leo Carlson and, the way you talk about him as being a cerebral player, that maybe he's the safer pick in that sense. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Like, is that fair Smith for him to be kind of labeled as the high upside guy? Like maybe you're taking a home run swing on him. Yeah, I I think that's fair to say. Uh, But I also think you're looking at the guy too, especially, uh, you know, in, in identifying some weaker opponents, his ability to cheat that side of the game a little bit, which, hey, listen, if you're confident about your ability to win, 
and you're going out there and, and you're trying to produce as best you can, even the best players in the National Hockey League still cheat for offense a little bit. And I think that is the case with Smith on occasion. It's not that he's an irresponsible player, but I, I think he's smart enough to pick his spots when he can do that. And again, you're talking about that dynamic upside that speaks to maybe a higher ceiling than what Carlson is. In, in my mind, both players are going to play. They're both going to have lengthy careers. They're both going to be really productive National Hockey League players. So when you first started talking about Adam Fantilli and Leo Carlson there and kind of mentioning them in that same tier, in that same breath, does their performance at the World Championships playing against men have anything to do with that? Because I think a lot of people saw what Leo Carlson was able to do, you know, centering that first line for Team Sweden, playing with some NHL players, and they were like, wait a second, like maybe we have a conversation here while Adam Fantilli was playing in more of a depth role for Team Canada. And understandably so, you look at some of the players they have, but you know what I'm saying there as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so in terms of pure performance, minutes, responsibility, I mean, Carlson would have the edge over Fantilli in that regard. I can't help but think about the highlight goal that that (laughs) Fantilli scored just to let people know, hey, don't forget about me. I'm still here. Don't forget about me uh, uh, type of thing. But uh, listen, there's no doubt that you take every game, every situation, and every tournament um, and and put it in a bowl and put it in your scouting bowl and you mix it up and you see what you have. And it's always nice to be able to, to be compared to what's happening in the pro game. So let's take Carlson, for example, plays in the SHL all year puts up good point totals, puts up good point totals in the playoffs in the SHL, which is really difficult. And then you think about Fantilli when a lot of their contemporaries are playing USHL, US under 18 program, Canadian hockey league. Well, Fantilli's playing in the NCAA against for the most part, older, stronger, heavier competition, and maybe a less of an NHL style of game. So you have to consider that as well. It's nice when you get the opportunity to see like players play on a stage with and against the best players in the world, which is what the world's presented for both of these players. Uh, And obviously, because they're both late birthday players, they didn't have the opportunity to represent their countries at the under-18s. And so this opportunity presented itself to both of them. And and really, you can't argue with what either one of them did. For Carlson, probably a little bit more comfortable playing alongside a number of pros than maybe Fantilli, who didn't get to to, uh, have that opportunity this year. Well, you talk about playing with pros. That's something that Matt Vamichkov did over in Russia this season, and you and I already kind of discussed it a little bit. There's some risk in drafting Matt Vamichkov, but, you know, everything aside, if the contract status wasn't a thing, if the situation in Russia right now wasn't a thing, would we really be talking about potentially Matt Vamichkov going number one overall or number two overall next to Connor Bedard? Yeah, I, I really do. I, I really believe that to be the case. I mean, the KHL is, is really difficult. And then you consider, you know, being traded from, you know, the the storied franchise there and then Scott St. Petersburg and then moving over to, to Sochi, a little bit more of a younger team, uh, a developing team, a little bit of an, a, of an outpost in that league, if you will. Uh, but the production that, that he had over there is, is not to turn a, turn a blind eye to. So, you know, I, I do believe we're in that conversation with Mitchkoff if if we're not in other circumstances. But really, you know, you're sitting there at the draft table and, and these are the real life, real time situations that you're presented with. And you can't ignore those things, especially for a team like Columbus that has spent a lot of time over the course of its years, kind of in the middle of the pack, you know, trying to get by the first round, which has happened, I think, once or maybe twice in, in franchise history. It's, it's really time now for that franchise to take that major step forward. I just don't know if we're speaking about Columbus specifically, if that's a road they can go down, uh, you know, picking at number three. All right. Say Matt Vamichkov doesn't end up going to the Blue Jackets, but maybe falls a little bit because of the situation. How happy is a team that ends up drafting Matt Vamichkov going to be in that situation, assuming he comes over and everything, because – you know, I think the pro comparable that everybody talks about is maybe Nikita Kucherov. So you think about a team that's drafting, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and where they might be in three, four years, and then adding a player like that to the mix has to be pretty exciting. It, it would have to be pretty exciting. But you'd also, as a general manager, have to have an extreme amount of confidence uh, in your ownership group that you're still going to be the general manager when and if that player decides to come over and play in the National Hockey League. I mean, Listen, even in these times, I still think there is that opportunity for players 
to, to come over and play. But again, if I'm talking about specific teams, you'd have to look at teams with multiple first round picks. Arizona at six and 12 would be a prime example there. You'd have to look at teams that have had a lot of success with Russian players in the past. I think Detroit would be a good example there. And I think Washington would be the obvious choice with the connection to Ovechkin. So those would be my three targets, uh, you know, inside the top 10. Maybe a St. Louis that's, that picks, I think, 10 or 11 um, with three first-round picks. It becomes a possibility for, for the Blues and Doug Armstrong as well. But again, you'd have to really do your due diligence and you'd have to be supremely confident in the GM in two things. A, your tenure is going to last until he can get here. And B, you have the resources to be able to get that player to come here, even if it is at the end of, the, uh, of his contract. All right. Goaltenders seem to be a bit of an unknown when it comes to the NHL draft. Like when you're drafting a goaltender for the most part, you're just taking a flyer on a guy and hoping it works out right outside of those guys that are really, really special first round talents. This year, we might not even see a goaltender drafted in the first round. First and foremost, do you think we will see one of these guys or a couple of these guys step up into the first round? And if not, who are some names we should know in terms of, of playing in the crease? I think you have to, you have to defer to the multi-pick teams. And we have a no- number of them. I think there's eight teams with multi-picks in the first round. St. Louis leading the way with three. Typically in that scenario, the second of those two first round picks is, is where you would see the goaltender go. The other element that that probably takes away from a goalie going in the first round is just the depth of the forward group. Right. It's really big. And so do you want to take a chance on a guy that that if – if he goes along the typical goalie developmental path is going to be playing NHL games for you in six or seven years, or do you want to take the guy in the first round in a deep class that you would have expectations of him playing in your top four on the D or top six in your forward group within the next three years. So that that's the thing that general managers and head scouts are going to be, uh, you know, thinking about when, when you get to the draft table. So, at that point, who is it? Michael Rabel, the, the USHL star, the six foot six guy. Is it uh, Adam Gahan who, you know, came out of nowhere to play so well at the at the World Juniors? Is it Carson Bjarnason, you know, the guy uh, who plays with the Brandon Wheat Kings who played with Canada in, in their bronze medal winning performance uh, at the under 18s? Those would probably be the names that, that we'd be looking at in terms of the first goalie off the board. But I just think you know, outside of the eight teams that have multi first round picks, it probably doesn't happen because of that. Maybe one of them sneaks in there. All right. I want to ask you about one more blue jacket specific prospect here. And uh, a guy that just had a massive performance at the Memorial cup winning, first of all, the MVP of the QMJHL postseason yeah. at the Memorial cup. You know, you wrote about some guys to watch going into the Memorial cup. What do you think about James Malatesta, a former fifth round pick by the blue jackets? Yeah, it's so nice when you have that kind of resume behind you. Yeah. It's also nice when you've played for a coach that's, that's coached in the National Hockey League. So those are two things that are that are in James' favor. Size, a little bit of a concern there. But his ability to get to the net front and, and, and you know, set up shop there and be sturdy on his skates and, and a guy who can score, that's what, that's what Malatesta brings to the table. So you can't discount that in spite of his size. Uh, but you know, in terms of effort, this guy, this guy has been identified for quite a long time in the Quebec major junior hockey league. Really? It goes back to, uh, it was the 2019 Canada winter games, if I'm not mistaken, where he helped guide Quebec to a win over Ontario on the final. And Quebec was a, was an underdog there. And Malatesta played such a large part in that. That's where his story started to get written. And of course it's now continued with a storybook ending, uh, with the Quebec run parts uh, and, and hoisting the Memorial cup. So really, really happy for the young man. It's nice when you can see a, a kid at that under 16 level uh, who is so proficient to continue that rise, to do it at the next level in junior hockey. And then of course you would project that that would continue on, um, you know, with whatever time you might left have left in junior into the American league and beyond. So again, another, another one of those really good forward prospects that the, that the blue jackets have. It's always cool when you can see a fifth round pick make it to the National Hockey League. So Malatesta is a guy I'm pulling for, for sure. That's for sure. Me too. I love talking to James. He's a great guy. So it was really cool to see uh, all the accolades and to be able to come away with that Memorial Cup championship in his final year of junior as well. Sam, you've already done a lot of pre-draft work for Sportsnet, but should our fans be uh, on the uh, on the lookout for anything else coming out before the draft? 
Yeah, we got some cool stuff going on. We're, we're, we're headed over to the Combine. I, I'm also doing some work with the NHL Network, which is probably more amenable to, to what your audience would be able to see uh, in Columbus. Uh, from a writing perspective, we'll have a mock draft. Uh, Jason Buchla and I, the former head scout of the Florida Panthers, who, whom I work really closely with, we'll have some mock drafts coming out uh, a couple of days before the draft. Uh, we'll have some reports from the Combine but also uh, NHL Network work in day two of the draft, which is important for teams that, uh, you know, are in the same ilk as where Columbus is. So there's there's lots going on. So uh, either between sportsnet.ca or the NHL Network uh, TV-wise, uh, hopefully your fans will tune in to some of the stuff we got going on. All right, Sam Cosentino, thank you very much. It was great to meet you. Great conversation, very educational. I appreciate it. Amazing. Thanks so much, Dylan. Good talking to you. All right, that'll do it for another week of the Pipeline Podcast presented by Ruoff Mortgage. As always, thanks very much for being with us. We'll talk again soon.